Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. We're going to be continuing in our study of the book of Malachi this morning. But uh, I'd like to pray again for us um, before we read the scriptures. And we will be reading from Malachi 2, 1 to 9, and 1 Peter 2, 9. Um, praise God. Just want to see you. See who we've got here this morning. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we praise you that you have us and we have you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, our King. Father, we thank you that you are a merciful and holy God and you've loved us in revealing yourself to us in so many ways, through creation, through our conscience, through the nation of Israel, through your holy word, and through your word made flesh in Jesus Christ, and the revelation that comes by the Spirit. Father, thank you that you are a God of revelation. And even for us who were lost in sin, darkness, depravity, so very far away, Lord, you reached down through the Lord Jesus Christ and you pulled us up out of the miry clay, out of the cesspool of our own self-centeredness. And you put us on a rock you gave us a firm place to stand. And Lord, today as we study your word, we pray for your help. Lord, make us alert. Give us a, give us a capacity to receive your word today and to let it do its work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So Malachi chapter 2, verse 1 to 9, and I'm not going to repeat the uh, introduction to Malachi. Um, we've been on this um, book a few weeks now, and if you want to have the introduction, please look back to old messages. But the context is quite important, and um, if you don't know the context, we'll do, f do find out later. I'm going to be reading from the um, New King James Version. And now, O priests, this commandment is for you if you will not hear and if you will not take it to heart to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already because you do not take it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on your faces, the refuse of your solemn feasts, and one will take you away with it. Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him, one of life and peace, and I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and turned many away from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts, but you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. 
you have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore I have therefore I also have made you contemptible and base before all the people, because you have not kept my ways, but have shown partiality in the law. And now we're going to go to um, 1 Peter 2, verse 9. And I'm very happy to see that some people still, one or two, (laughs) still have um, hard copies of the Bible. Obviously, I'm biased. But I do think, and I can, one day maybe I'll preach about this, but I do believe that a hard copy of the Bible is better than a tablet or a phone. And there are reasons for that. It's not, there are good reasons for that. Okay, another day. I don't want to get distracted. (laughs) Bless you. I'm glad you've got something. You got the word of God and beautiful. I like that. Okay. Now, this word that I just read to Malachi, from Malachi, from God, through Malachi, to the people, was to the priests. Okay? You might think, what on, how relevant is that to us today? 2,600 years later. But it's very relevant. 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation. Now this is spoken to the saints of God in Christ Jesus. And that includes you and me. Hallelujah. Even though we are Jew and Gentile. Well, Gentile. Praise God. But you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood a holy nation his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light and that is the ongoing ministry of the priest of which We are members. Okay. So let's go back to Malachi and see how this might be relevant to us today. If you want a a name for this message this morning, it's called The Call of the Priesthood. The Call of the Priesthood. And I believe it is acutely relevant for the church today. So, the first two verses of chapter 2 of Malachi say, And now, O priests, this commandment is for you, if you will not hear and if you will not take it to heart, to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I've cursed them already because you do not take it to heart. Now, we can come in every Sunday And we can listen to the word of God. And you can even understand it. And you can even study it. But it's very possible you don't take it to heart. To take the word of God to heart, or to take anything to heart, means to allow it to go deep inside of you. Because unless it does, you're not going to change. But if you let the word of God get to the place of your affections, then it can do its power. It can do its supernatural work. Hallelujah. By the spirit of God. Who breathes life through his word into our hearts if we let him. We have to let the word of God 
dwell deeply in our hearts. We've got to let it get there to start with and then let it stay there. So that it affects us unto change. And that requires some costly agreement on the part of your will. You understand what I'm saying? It's quite a deep thing, but it's very, very important because there are millions of people that come to church and go away and they're not changed. It's not necessarily because the Holy Spirit isn't moving. It's because they have stubborn hearts and they want to change. <laughs> God, sometimes, although it doesn't say it quite in this way in the Bible, but God is often described as a gentleman. He is gentle and humble in heart. Learn from me, Jesus said. Then you will find rest for your souls. But to take it to heart requires a costly agreement of our wills. And to allow the word of God to dwell richly in our, not to let it flutter away, but to hold on to it. Okay? And that's what these people in Malachi's day were not doing. The priests. It was too costly for them. Perhaps they were thinking of their comforts or the comforts of their grandparents who'd come from Babylon. A great expense to be the pioneering remnant of the returnees of the children of Israel to the land. Hallelujah. And verse 3 says there are consequences of ignoring God's loving rebuke. You know, every rebuke that comes from God is out of love. He's not a bully. He's not an abuser. And sometimes we need to renounce the inklings of that thought. Sometimes that lie from the devil prevents us taking his word to our heart and embracing his loving rebuke. The writer to the Hebrews, I believe, said, and you've forgotten that word of admonition. You know, a father loves or rebukes those he loves. Of course he does. We cannot afford to ignore the loving rebuke of our Heavenly Father. Otherwise, we will take his grace in vain. It happens. Don't think it can't happen to you. Otherwise, you're in a sort of cloud cuckoo land. <laughs> you're in delusion. So friends, as you listen to this message, don't just let it pass over your head. Take it to your heart insofar that you know God is speaking to you. And God said through Malachi, I will spread refuse on your faces, the refuse of your solemn feasts, and one will take you away with it. In other words, you'd be taken outside the camp and put in an unclean place, along with the stuff that couldn't be offered to God from the sacrifices. So you would be unfit to minister. And remember... We are all ministers through our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. He has made us competent of a new covenant that's better than the one that Malachi ministered under. Praise God. But I believe the same principle applies to us. If we don't take to heart his words of loving rebuke when that's appropriate, then we will become unfit to minister and we will be removed from fellowship and become a laughing stock. I mean, think about some of the things that have happened in the church are happening 
I mean the church at large, the wider church. In, thank you, we prayed, we prayed for this nation today, how, how desperately we need to pray, and for the church too. I'd like to say a, f- a bit about the priesthood now, verse 4 and 5 here. And we're going to just go, we're going to l- explore a little bit about what the Levitical priesthood actually was all about. But verse 4 and 5 says, Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him, one of life and peace. And I gave them to him that he might fear me, so he feared me and was reverent before my name. Now, let's just turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 32. Exodus 32. And we're going to read from verse 25 to 29. And the context of this was when the children of Israel came to Mount Sinai. On, and it was actually the, the, first, the first day of Pentecost, actually. They came to Mount Sinai. And the passage we're going to read follows what took place when Moses came down the mountain with the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. Can you remember what the people got up to? unbelievably under Aaron's leadership what did they do they made an idol of a golden calf I mean unbelievable and so this is where the story picks is taken up all right uh, Exodus 32 25 to 29 now when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies. You know, God is really, really concerned for his testimony. I think that's one of the reasons why he calls his people to a higher account than the people around them, because they are the holy priests of God that show forth, are supposed to show forth the splendor of him who called them out of darkness so that the nations and the people living around them can see God okay so for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said whoever is on the Lord's side come to me and all the sons of Levi okay the sons of Levi this is the tribe of Levi remember the 12 tribes of Jacob who became Israel, Levi was one of the sons. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And he said, that's Moses said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp. And let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, that he may bestow on you a blessing this day, for every man has opposed his son and his brother. So the tribe of Levi were blessed that day by God, because they had a zeal for God's holy honor following the detestable acts of many of the children of Israel in bowing down to this gold, making this golden calf and getting up to revelry and stuff. And 3,000 people were killed by the Levites. I mean, it's an utterly shocking thing. But God blessed them because of their zeal for his honor. Right, let's go to Deuteronomy 33, 8 to 11. And this is Moses' blessing. This is like fast forward 40 years, okay? This is 
the blessing of Moses on the plains of Jericho before, just before Moses goes up to Mount Nebo. This is his end of ministry speech, okay, 40 years later. And this is his blessing, verse 8 to 11, to the tribe of Levi. Deuteronomy 33, 8 to 11. And of Levi, he said, let your Thummim and your Urim be with your Holy One, whom you tested at Massa, and with whom you contended at the waters of Meribah, who says of his father and mother, listen to this, I have not seen them, nor did he acknowledge his brothers or know his own children, for they have observed your word and kept your covenant. They shall teach Jacob your judgments and Israel your law. They shall put incense before you and a whole burnt sacrifice on your altar. Bless his substance, Lord, and accept the work of his hands. Strike the loins of those who rise against him and of those who hate him that they rise not again. Now, very interesting. Verse 10 says, sorry, verse 9. It says, who says of his father and mother, I have not seen them, nor did he acknowledge his brothers or know his own children, for they observed your word and kept your covenant. That, I think, could refer to what they did. <laughs> you know, they didn't spare their brothers and their sisters when they went throughout the camp with their swords, showing their zeal for God. Does that remind you of somebody else that said something a bit similar? Who is that? Jesus. So I'm just going to read a verse from Luke 12, Luke 14, verse 26. This is what Jesus says. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. I'll, I'll let you think about that. Okay. Mm. Let's look at Numbers chapter 3. Oh, that we would be overcome by the zeal of the Holy One of Israel. I don't think God wants us to go around with swords, by the way. I don't think he wants us to do that. Peter misunderstood Jesus on one occasion, didn't he? And Jesus had to, repl had to heal the servants, the high priest's servants here. So please, don't, don't, uh, don't get me wrong this morning. But, you know, Jesus said, if something causes you to sin, chop it off. I don't think he meant use a sword then either, either. But there is a necessary ruthlessness that comes with a disciple of Jesus. Ruthless against sin and the flesh. Okay? Numbers 3, verse 11 to 13. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now behold, I myself have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of every firstborn who opens the womb among the children of Israel. Therefore the Levites shall be mine, because all the firstborn are mine. On the day that I struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified to myself all the firstborn of Israel, both man and beast, they shall be mine. I am the Lord. Let me try to explain that. The tribe of, the tribe of Levi was set apart as a special tribe that would serve God and serve the people in the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a forerunner of the temple. It was a special tent where God lived in the middle of the camp of the children of Israel. Just as 
in later years, the temple in the middle of Jerusalem was where God lived in the middle of his people. And quite literally, he did live there. Well, until, until he departed because the sin had reached, the sin of the people reached such a level. But there was a time where God's Shekinah glory, I mean, Solomon knew perfectly well, you know, how can anything we build ever contain God who the whole universe couldn't even fill? But in a sense, there was a tangible, even visible presence of the glory of God Almighty in and upon that tabernacle and in the Holy of Holies when the temple was built. Okay? And it was the Levite tribe, the tribe of Levi, that was given the honor and the privilege and the responsibility to manage all the affairs of the temple. The prayers, the sacrifices, the offerings, and to help people from the other tribes come and bring their sacrifices to serve the people before God so that God could dwell in their midst. It's an awesome thing. It really is when you think about it. It's even more awesome to think that God is among us today, now. We might not see him in that physical way. But the more spiritually sensitive we become, the more we do realize and sense the awe of his holy presence within us and among us. Now, God said here that, do you remember the Passover? And what did the children of Israel have to do that God told them to do that their firstborn could be spared. They put the blood on the doorposts and the lintels. And those that did, their firstborn were spared. But God says here that I, because that happened, it's like you owe me <laughs> the firstborn. Because I saved your life, because you put the blood on the doorposts, and all the Egyptians who didn't, they died. But you owe me. You owe me your firstborn. But what I'll do, says God, is I will take, in place of you, I will take the Levite tribe. Okay? That's what he's saying. I will take the Levites in your place. So all the other 11 tribes, right, you can get on and live your holy lives, but I want that one tribe to minister and serve me in the tabernacle. Okay? Very interesting. So, in a sense, the Levites were substitutes for the rest of the people, and they would be one particularly holy tribe of priests, okay, to serve God exclusively. Very interesting. Because in many ways, we, we've been called similarly. Our lives, through the blood of Jesus, have been saved. And we give them back to him as living sacrifices. This is our holy and pleasing act of worship. Okay? So what you learn about the Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament is relevant because it has something to say about our ministry and why we are ministering servants of God today. It's, it's, it's bigger and better than it was <laughs> but what, but it, it stands on this foundation. Praise God. And besides, we are engrafted now into the commonwealth of the people of God, of whom Israel is the root still. And the nourishing sap still comes from them and brings life to the branches of the nations that have been grafted in. Amen. Oh, there's another passage in Numbers that I think is particularly apt and that might actually be the bit that Malachi is referring to 
in uh, chapter 2. So turn to Numbers. Um, I'm going to read from the ESV version. Numbers 25, 1 to 13. Now this, have you heard of Phineas? He was a Levite. He was a priest. Now, at the beginning of, of the children of Israel's journey and 40-year journey in the desert, they, they messed up big time. And they had the golden calf incident. And the Levites showed their zeal for God, and they slaughtered 3,000 people. Now, at the end of their 40-year journey, unbelievably, they messed up again. In some ways, even worse. Do you remember Balaam? The ba very strange story. Very, very strange story. But after Balaam's the Balaam incident, you have Numbers 25, where the people of Israel um, allow women from the, from the Moabites, is it the Moabites? The Moabite women to come into the camp and to seduce the men. So they had sexual relations with Moabite women and more than that, they went to the, they did idolatry. They bowed down to Baal. Can you believe it? Baal. I mean, he's, not that there's any, comp not that God has any competitor in a way. Okay, totally not. But, but Baal was the false god or principality of that land that they kept on struggling with. You've all heard of Baal, if you read the Bible. And they bowed down to Baal. And so a plague, a plague broke out. And so this is where we take up the story of Phineas. While Israel lived in Acacia Grove or Shittim, the people began to whore with the descendants of Moab. These invited the people, or commit harlotry, these invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor. You know what? Yoke. We're told not to unevenly yoke ourselves, aren't we? But the, the holy people of God here, just before they enter the promised land, can you believe it? Yoke themselves to this, this demonic entity, the Baal of Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you kill those of his men who have yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel, while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman, through her belly." Thus, the plague on the people of Israel was stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. That's six times, if my arithmetic is correct, six times those that died on the previous occasion 40 years earlier. But praise God, once again, it was the zeal this time not of the whole tribe, but of one Levite. We just couldn't stand it. Something of the zeal of God overtook him. And he took a spear and he plunged it through both the man and the woman. Now, of course, we're not suggesting anybody does anything like that today. But I think we need the same kind of righteous 
indignation and zeal to motivate us unto love and good deeds. Praise God. Let's return to our text in Malachi. Praise the Lord. Verse 5, my covenant was with them one of life and peace. And I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. That could almost be talking of Phineas, because God says he did cut a covenant with Phineas's descendants that was perpetual and was of peace. If you refer back to Numbers, you can see that. The law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and turned many away from iniquity. Praise God. You know, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is something we need to reclaim in the church very, very urgently and desperately. It says, again, when the children of Israel arrived at Mount Sinai, God came down the mountain. It was an absolutely terrifying experience. The mountain shook greatly, and the cloud of God descended upon the mountain. And it says in Exodus 20, 20, Chapter 20, verse 20, this is after God speaks audibly the Ten Commandments, all right? And Moses said to the people, do not fear or do not be afraid, for God has come to test you that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. Proverbs 16, 6 says, by the fear of the Lord, one turns from evil. God teaches us the fear of the Lord as we take to heart his word. God teaches and imparts the fear of him to our hearts as we as we spend time with him, as we worship him, as we magnify him for who he is. The fear of the Lord is simply realizing who God is. God is awesome and holy. Way beyond our comprehension. He's holy, holy, holy. It's the preeminent characteristic of God. Holy, holy, holy. This is the perpetual utterance of the heavenly beings in heaven. Always. And even they have to cover their faces before the presence of God. Holiness means being completely other, being completely set apart, being completely other and different. And there's no one that's more holy than God. Although he made us in his image, he is holy. And if we don't fear him, we don't know him. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And people who don't know their Bibles, (laughs) Christians who don't know their Bibles or go sit under liberal teaching 
They might think, well, that was for the Old Testament. <laughs> hmm. They haven't read the Bibles. I'm going to read a few, a few um, verses from the book of Acts. And I'd like you afterwards, ask this question first. Can you identify a pattern here? I'm going to start in Acts 2. I'm going to read verse 42 to 43 of Acts 2. And I'm going to read four passages in Acts and, uh, and ask you, is the fear of the Lord relevant for us today? Well, of course it is. But <laughs> what is the pattern here? Okay. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then, then, fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Next one is Acts 5. And this follows the death of Ananias and his wife Sapphira for lying to the Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, Acts 5, verse 10 to 12. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead. And carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Praise God. Next one is Acts 9, 31. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord... And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. I hope you're seeing a pattern. One more. Uh, chapter 19, verse 15 to 17. All right, and now this follows non-Christians trying to exorcise somebody, trying to deliver somebody without really knowing Jesus. Verse 15. The evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus and fear fell on them all, and the name of Jesus was glorified. So, what was the pattern? The fear of the Lord and signs and wonders, multiplication, honor to God. Hallelujah. Jesus taught on the fear of the Lord on several occasions. In Luke 12, 4 to 7, he said, I say to you, my friends, and Jesus' his friends are those who obey his commandments. My friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. Verse 5, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And are not one of them is forgotten before God? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. It's a beautiful passage because it, it sort of juxtaposition with the love of God and the fear of God. 
But Jesus delighted in the fear of the Lord. It's what Isaiah 11 tells us, that the Messiah will be full of the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he delighted in the fear of the Lord because he knew the Father better than anyone else. To know God is not just to love him, but is to fear him. I'd read to you some other words from Jesus because I think this is so, so important. Forgive me if I go on a little longer this morning. Just allow me. Uh, Matthew 13. You might have to look this up yourself. Matthew 13, 40 to 43. And this is the interpretation of uh, the parable of the weeds or the... the, um, the tares, the wheat and the tares, okay. Matthew 13, um, I'll read verse 40 to 43. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom. I'll read that again. They, you know, Verse 41 is astounding. The Son of Man will send out his angels. Jesus is not an angel. The angels bow to Jesus. He's the Son of God. He's the divine Messiah. The Son of Man will send out his angels. And they will gather out of his kingdom. Right? Out of his kingdom, right before Jesus returns, his kingdom is pretty mixed. All right. We have a lot of other parables as well on that subject, especially the parable of the dragnet. They will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend or cause sin. And those who practice lawlessness. And they will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Wow. Praise God. Friends, we do take this to heart. We do take this to heart. Because we're not those that shrink back and are destroyed. Second Corinthians 7, 1 says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh or defilement of the body and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Beloved, we are commanded to perfect holiness in the fear of God. That is how. We perfect holiness. We we come to know God in his holiness. Hallelujah. And we, we cultivate the fear of the Lord, just as Jesus did. And the promises that Paul is talking about at the beginning of chapter 7 of 2 Corinthians I'll read from verse 17 of the previous chapter. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do, well, the promises are that we are the separated people of God. We are the privileged to be children, priests of the Most High God. Just like the Levites, but more. Just like Phineas and his descendants, but more. Hallelujah. Through the merits of Jesus Christ, our High Priest. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. You see, God cannot receive us. Some, sometimes people say, well, it's impossible. You know, God can do anything. No, he can't change for starters. I think David Pawson made a list of 26 things that God can't do. And did a sermon on it. 
But one of the things God can't change, he's holy. He can't change. But friends, we have to. And we're given the grace of God through Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit to change. It's called repentance. And again and again in the scriptures, God is crying out, repent, change. Because he can't. It's not as if he wants to. But you know, he took on flesh. He went that far. That was as far as he could go. And he was still God. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Amen. And just some other Verses that you know very well from Hebrews 12, the end of chapter 12, verse 28 and 29 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire okay back to Malachi got a few more minutes just one or two other things I want to say before we close verse 6 and 7 of Malachi 2 says the law of truth was in his mouth and Injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity. This is God reminding the priests or the Levites that once they did walk with him in holiness when the zeal of God was in their hearts. And they knew God and they did exploits. Turn and turned many away from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge. And people should seek the law from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Friends, do you know that you are a messenger of the Lord of hosts? Incredible. You know, I believe in the priesthood of of all believers. There are some churches that have priests. And I, I don't really want to, I, I, I don't want to mock them. I <laughs> know Elijah mocked some other priests, didn't he? But, you know, they dress themselves up in all sorts of fine garments. And, and I know that doesn't necessarily mean anything. But, friends, we are all priests. We are all priests. Listen to what the writer to the Hebrews says in chapter 5, verse 12. He says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. Okay? He says you ought to be teachers. Friends, it's not, all right, we're not all called to the office of teacher. We're not all necessarily called to preach as the handful of us do in Cornerstone in this way. But we all carry influence and knowledge in God to teach our neighbors, our friends, our groups. We are all called to leadership influence in that capacity. 
We should all know the holy oracles of God because we're all called to the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is not the line of Levi. Anyway, it's the line of Judah. And we're not, most of us here, aren't Jewish. But that's okay. Praise God. Ephesians 4. Just Ephesians 4. This is a verse I love to mention. 11 and 12. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. He himself gave some, that's Jesus, to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Okay? We can't all be the office those fivefold ministries, okay? And then it says, for or because or, or so that the equipping of the saints, those gifts of teacher, prophet, pastor, evangelist, apostle are given for the equipping of all the saints. Hallelujah. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Friends, you have a calling as a priest unto ministry. Not to dress up in fancy clothes or necessarily stand at the front and speak like I'm speaking. But you have an, you have an office, a calling, a purpose to fulfill with your neighbors, with your family, with your friend. Whoever God puts you among, your colleagues at work. Praise the Lord. Do you believe in the priesthood of all believers? Good. And one of the most important functions of a priest is to use their mouths properly. To be careful about what we say and how we say it. It's massively important. Massive. In Malachi. All right. Look at those verses again in Malachi that make mention of the priest's mouth. The law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. Hallelujah. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and the people should seek the law from his mouth. I am quite regularly convicted about what comes out of my mouth. And it's not always what it should be. Friends, we need to be very careful in how we speak and what we say. And I think I'm going to start to draw this message to a close. I was going to read from James 3. But you read James 3. It's all about the tongue. It says, I think the tongue is a restless evil, you know, unrivaled among the members of the body. With it, you know, a forest can be set ablaze. <laughs> words of life, words of death. With many words, sin is not absent. You know, um, I've got a personal confession to make. I do certainly speak far too much. And very often I say too much too soon. And it's in the flesh and not the spirit. And we are trying, my wife and I, we're trying to reach out to our neighbors. Um, as I hope you all are. <laughs> and there have been a couple of occasions recently where we had opportunities and and I just said too much too soon. I messed up. And, um, you know, when we speak, we reach out to people, whoever they are really, we want to do so in love. And love seeks to empower somebody's will. So often I think, and I'm speaking for myself, I don't consciously think I'm doing this, but I end up doing this, is basically doing the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, you can't do the work of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he can do his work through you, 
when you're yielded to him. But when we speak the truth in love, we are honoring somebody who's been made in the image of God and has been given the priceless gift of free will. We don't speak in a manipulative, controlling way. Now, sometimes you need to search your heart because it's only later that you realize that you've done that. Because the heart is deceitful. It is. Even with good intentions. I know. I put my foot in it the whole time. And Dorcas and I were trying to learn in prayer and indeed how to do this God's way. Because when we have God's word for somebody that is genuinely out of love and from, from the Spirit, there will be results. <laughs> there will. Um, somebody in this church, I don't think they're here today, but they shared a testimony with us a few days ago. They were doing some gardening in their garden. Uh, it was a few weeks ago. And the neighbor that they don't have a great relationship with, sadly, was having a barbecue, hadn't invited them. And as this particular person did their gardening, they were out of view of the neighbors, but the neighbors were talking about them very unkindly, very cruelly. Can you believe? And it really hurt them. And this person, who will remain anonymous, carried on with their gardening. Meanwhile, their blood began to boil as they heard these lies from their neighbor. And they were just sort of getting ready to rebuke and to give them a piece of their mind. And the Holy Spirit said, come inside. Come inside with me. So they left their tools, went inside. And God said, look, let me deal with this. And they just poured out their heart to God. They poured out their heart to God. Got it all out. And they didn't actually. Sometimes there is a time and a place for confronting your neighbors, okay? But it wasn't to be on this occasion. And ever since, the neighbors haven't been any problem at all. God dealt with it his way. Okay, it was just a, it was just a testimony that touched me this week that I heard. Praise God. We are to walk in peace and equity with the Lord. Walk with him in intimate fellowship and belonging. That's the call as priests before God. Hallelujah. And you will turn many away from iniquity. Verse 6 in Malachi. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That's the word of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 3. Very similar to the word in Philippians 2.15. Be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Praise God. Sadly, in Malachi's day, those last two verses tell us that they didn't embrace the rebuke. It says, but you have departed from the... Well, they might have afterwards, but the current situation, as Malachi brought this word, was that they had departed from the way. You caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. That's the fourth time in that short passage that God uses his title, the Lord of hosts, or the Lord God Almighty. Hosts, Lord of hosts means the Lord of heaven's armies, or the captain of heaven's armies. Therefore, I also have made you contemptible and base before all the people, because you have not kept my ways, but have shown partiality in the law friends we are in a we are in a, in a in a era where we have an apostate church 
not talking about any particular denomination, but there are those, probably most, I mean, most denominations will have an expression of falling away. God talks in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 about a great falling away. And when there is that great falling away, that gives in a way a platform for the man of lawlessness to rise up. And until that great falling away has taken place, we won't see the Antichrist made fully manifest. God says, come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people. Okay, the last, last passage I'm going to read from 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of of those who do not obey the gospel of God. Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and sinner appear? Amen. It's time for, right, it's time for judgment to begin in the household of God. And friends, I believe it already has. I really do. As a church leader, I have to have dealings with other churches. Um, brings me into contact with some courageous Anglican evangelicals. And also brings me into contact with others who don't embrace the full counsel of God. And if you don't embrace the full counsel of God, you might not. You might as well not embrace any of it, really. Because it all holds together as a whole. And we are living in a very crooked and depraved generation. We need to pray that God will keep us on the straight and narrow. And empower us in that ministry of his priests and servants. Heeding his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us today through Malachi, your word to the priests, the call of the priesthood. And Lord, help us take to heart not just what I've said, but what you have spoken to our hearts. Help us to take it to heart that we can repent and change and follow in the way of Jesus our great high priest. Amen.